G'day everyone and welcome to a two-part special on Amiga sampling technology. Now, I've already done a video that brushes over the techniques for making a track start to finish using tracker software, but I wanted to look at what you get in the box with these uh, old school samplers because there was a lot of promise about what you could make just with this sampler and, for instance, the floppy disk that came with the box. We'll also open up some of these samplers and have a bit of a look at how they got them so cheap. It's going to be a bit of a technical journey, but that's all part of the fun of looking at Amiga samplers. Let's go down that rabbit hole. Now, a good place to start is with one of the original Amiga 1000 samplers because this is how you should build a sampler. It retailed for $175 and was hand assembled in Massachusetts, USA. So the Future Sound was one of the very first Amiga Sound capture devices as far as I'm aware. And you can see it has a gain control on the front as well as a line-in socket and a microphone socket. And in fact, it shipped with a microphone as part of the package. And you could also leave your printer plugged in. This was a pass-through, which meant you could have uh, whatever device was usually plugged into your parallel port. And that would go off to your printer, for instance. And when you were using the Future Sound, you would tap the little button it would light up and the future sound would operate and when you tapped it off again it would go back to being the printer. Now in the case of this I've just plugged in a MIDI device so you could use your synthesizers plugged into this and you could have your future sound just tap in when you need it. So here's the future sound software and I've got it emulating because I don't own an Amiga 1000 but you'll be able to see it's a very developer style tool. And when you go to open a file, you'll see a whole load of folders with development tools for different platforms. And what we're going to do today is open one of the samples that came with the Future Sound. Take us back to where we're supposed to be, Mr. Sulu. Walk back to one. Walk back to one. Wow. I wonder if they cleared the copyright on that one. So let's have a very quick look in the Future Sound. I really do love these old boxes. They're so elegant with the way they work and it will just flip off, the top will flip off and there we go. Ah, you can see there, oh we got it upside down. Look at that, even if you don't know much about electronics you can probably look at this and see that there's some pretty gorgeous design in here and we're not cutting costs at this point. You've got your mic socket there which um, of course feeds into your, uh, your op amp here, this is a quad op amp so you've got four of them in here and you'll see a bit of the repetitive circuitry around the outside here. We've then got the ADC here, which uh, converts from your analog signal over here into a digital signal that can be sent to your parallel port. And you can see a bit of switching logic down here and a eight-way flip-flop here as well. And I assume that is for the on-off button so that when you tap that button, it hijacks the pins that it needs for the, the circuit and when you put it into bypass mode it just passes them back out to the uh, the real world out here. So apart from that there is a chip here that is missing and I would say that this is a multi-purpose board and might have a video sampler or something like that. Either way uh, this is how a sampler should be built in particular with the preamp circuitry that's sitting on the top here. This is what's gonna be missing, I'm guessing, once we start looking at the cut price samplers that are coming next. So remember that, that's how you should build a sampler. Now let's see what we get with a cheap sampler. All right, so first in the uh, boxed editions here, we've got uh, the master sound by a company called Microdeal. Uh, these guys uh, did a whole bunch of software and things back in the day, but one thing they had a crack at pretty early on was a sound sampler solution, which is right here. And you can see on the back of the box, it promises a bunch of things, but the most interesting one here is, it's as simple to record as tapping keys on the computer's keyboard. And it allows you to play back your own sequenced sounds from the sequencer while displaying an IFF picture file, great for creating your own public domain discs. Woo! I think I know what I'm doing today. And inside the box, uh, as you'd expect, the floppy disk with the software, a uh, semi-comprehensive manual here with information on uh, how the sequencer works, which might come in handy later on, and the sampler itself with a little socket on the top. I would assume this is mono. Let's pop the top off and have a look. So getting inside, this thing's quite interesting. It's just got these little tabs here that uh, basically break open. There we go, no screwdriver required. Ooh! <laughs> <laughs> and what is in the box? Nothing! Okay, so this is, oh, it's broken. But this is obviously a mono input, but have a look at this. It's a stereo jack. You can see it's actually um, 
yeah, it's got the uh, pin there that's unused. It's a stereo jack and uh, just has a mono input. And here's our money shot. This is the 807576 uh, from the 18th week of 1991. I might get a bit geeky for a second and talk about this chip. This chip is uh, very common to sampling technology in the 1980s. It was made for many, many years. In fact, you can still buy a derivative of this chip now. And what this chip does is it runs in two modes, unipolar and bipolar mode. Unipolar is where it will take the value zero and return a zero bit and it'll take whatever the maximum voltage is and return a value between zero and 255, depending on your voltage. Now, we obviously are gonna run in what's called bipolar mode because when you have a speaker if you think about it it's a bipolar device it pushes out and it pulls back and it in fact it rests in the middle but when it's moving it's moving in and it's moving out and this is also known as AC voltage it pushes into the positive and it pulls into the negative so it has a positive and a negative swing and if it's sitting in its middle position doing nothing, uh, it means that this is gonna be value 127. And that would mean if you had this sampler plugged in and you pulled it out, it would suddenly drop to zero and your Amiga would go bang, or it wouldn't go bang, your speakers would go bang, and the value would just slam down to zero as uh, the bits disappear. And as you plugged it back in as well, it would go crack and jump back to the 127 value. This is called signed data where your zero point is effectively your halfway point through the byte, and you can go positive 127 and negative 127. And you've got your zero point in the middle. So that's what this circuitry around here is doing. It's providing a reference voltage. Uh, one of these will be a reference pin. I think it's this one. This has no level controls or anything like that. Uh, it, what you plug in is what it gets and you have to set the volume externally in order to set the volume on this. But let's put it back together and have a look and put this wire back on. All right, let's fire on the soldering iron, pre-solder the tip, and then we'll just... Ooh. Sorry, that's a terrible bit of soldering there, uh, but that'll hold. And it's funny, because it naturally wants to sit this way up, but you actually have to flip it and it sort of sits like this. <laughs> Look at this, there's no screws. It basically holds and strain relieves itself from these little plastic tabs here on either side. There's nothing holding this piece of metal or anything. It's purely just the bit of plastic and the bit of uh, plastic here pushing down on top that holds it together. It's very um, clever in the fact it's so fucking cheap. <laughs> There we go. There's our master sound, restored and ready to roll. So we simply plug it in the Amiga and uh, put the floppy disk in with the software and we're right to go. It'll come up with a splash screen. Yeah, we just click on that and then the software will appear. 1989. Thanks, Ferry and Paul. First, we need some waveforms. So I'll hit record on one of my old house tracks and we'll see what it sounds like. And what we're listening to now is the loop through the Amiga. And so if we stop the recording and press play, we should hear something very similar. So that's a playback on what we just recorded. Now it's a little muffly, so what I'm gonna do is crank up the sample rate. And look at this, the sample rate goes right the way up to 55.9 kilohertz, which is really high even by today's standards. In 1989, this would have been huge. And it's a bit muffly, so what we're going to do is jump in and turn the filter off. And even though we run out of memory in seven seconds, you can hear the clarity in that recording. It's fantastic. Even if we drop the sample rate. So even at 30 kilohertz, I mean, that's a really good sounding recording, um, especially for a super cheap sampler. A feature of any waveform editor is to be able to set an in and an out point. And you can see here, I've got my two points, if I can click them. And that will allow me to select a region. And I can zoom in once I've selected a region and get a much cleaner view. Set an in and an out point and try to loop it. 
So another feature we have here is a double speed button. And if we click this double the speed, what it's going to do is half the length and double the speed of the sample. But we can counteract that by turning the sample rate to exactly half. And it still sounds pretty good. So this was a trick. You would half the sample rate to get more memory. But if you go too low, and you can start to hear the crunch come back in there. So yeah, we've also got features like reverse and fade in and fade out. And that's pretty much all the features you've got. You do have a spectrum analyzer that looks super cool and an oscilloscope as well, both that just analyze the input, but they don't pass through the audio or anything, so you can't actually hear what's going on. And you've also got the sequencer. Excellent. So we'll switch to our sequencer, and you can see this is our virtual sequencer here. And we're going to isolate a kick drum. And we're going to program that into position number one. And you can see it thinks about it. And then in the grid on the uh, right hand side here, you can see it's in memory. That little square symbolizes that. And we'll put our snare in. And we'll put a hi hat in as well. All right, let's have a listen to all our samples. So I'm selecting which sample we want to listen to using the numeric keypad and triggering it using the keyboard. So yeah, a little tricky, but let's try adding some parts. This is firstly a hi-hat part, and we're going to record them to channel one and hit record on our virtual tape recorder and do a live take. And then we're going to switch to channel two and drop in a kick drum. We're going to overdub a snare drum. And you can hear the timings all over the place. And that's partially because I'm doing it live, but also because it snaps it to the nearest 1 25th of a second. That's not a lot of resolution. Put a bass line in there as well. And we'll finally put some chords in. All right, let's have a listen to what we've got. Just press rewind there on our virtual tape machine. And that is as much as you can do in the sequencer. You can hear the timing is all over the place. I think I was being a little too ambitious, so if we're going to make this public domain demo disc, let's maybe keep it to one channel with some larger slabs of audio. So something that was really exciting back in the day was when you got a floppy disk that had a long form audio track on it. And because you didn't have enough memory to fit a full track on a floppy disk, what you would do is sample a track and take the verses and the choruses and loop them in special ways like I'm doing here. Here we go. And I was quite surprised with how good this was sounding, and then <laughs> I hit a pretty serious show-stopping problem. Oh, that must be all the memory we've got. Oh, no! <laughs> We're out of memory! Oh, so devastated. All right, we're just chopping at the end there. <laughs> right on the buddy. We have to swap the disc, and I've prepared a disc here, which should allow us to save Master Seek. S E Q. All right, here we go. <laughs> I'm so excited right now. Oh, this sequencer really sucks. Oh, we're saved. All right, let's test it. 
So we've got our Amiga booted and fingers crossed it shall work. Looks like it's working to me. Oh, look at that. So there we go, you can hear the verse loop there. And who are the Grand Prix? Well, that's actually a band I play in. So I use this track because there's a lot of repetition in the verses and the choruses, and it just seemed that it would loop quite well. And to exit out, you hit the mouse button, and it says, right to us for a fan pack. So that's about it for the master sound. The only final thing to do is to listen to the demo that came on the disc. <laughs> no, I can't listen to any more of that. It's it's seagulls with Run DMC. I I don't know. There's no words to describe <laughs> this demo. <laughs> no, I can't listen to it. All right, so <laughs> this is. This is very version one software. I mean, no one in their right mind would ever try to use this sequencer for anything. They would use a tracker uh, and, and do all their music and that. But this was really about what comes in the box because it's supposed to come with at least the minimal amount of software to be able to do something. And I guess this really is the minimum, but this whole tape counter logic and not having an events list or anything where you can tighten the timing up or quantize anything to get it in a grid. Um, it's real minimal. <laughs> but Mike Rodil kept working on their software and within a year, they'd come up with a new sampler. Ah, oh, look at this. That wins prizes, I reckon, for one of the best ever box designs for any audio product ever. How can you not buy that? <laughs> you just have to, it's amazing. It's the Stereo Master. You can see we've got the software, as you'd expect, the cartridge, which this time has a stereo input. And you can see, compared to the uh, Master Sound, they've managed to slice a good part off the, the cartridge. You've got here the manual as well, um, and this has got quite a lot of information in it. You've got a cable with it, and of course, more importantly, a nice color brochure for all the other software. So that's inside the box. Let's have a quick look inside the Stereo Master. And it's another one of these clip boxes. Uh, obviously all the rage for uh, budget electronics in the day. There we go. We're in like Flynn, as they say. Okay, so this is the Stereo Master. And it's an even smaller board, I think, than the, um, the Master Sound. But uh, at least it's stereo. You can see it has three cables. And, ah, we have an extra chip in here. All right, let's um, have a look at what we got. Oh, and that's how you do stereo on a budget, kids. Look at this, this is great. We got the same mono converter here. This is um, the same converter we had in the master sound here. But what we're doing, instead of having two converters for stereo, one for left and one for right, we're using a switch here, which is a uh, bilateral switch or quad bilateral switch. And that's taking the left and right input and it's switching between left and right every time it samples. So it'll sample from the left hand side, it'll sample from the right hand side, sample from the left hand side, sample from the right side, and it switches back and forth uh, depending on if it's an odd or an even sample. Because if you had two ADCs, the problem would be that you, still need, you can only still send one at a time uh, to your output, so you would have to have a sample and hold in each one and then dump one out and then call the next one. So you'd still be switching between the two anyway, except you could obviously manage your uh, ADC a little bit better if you did that. But the thing was, this chip is the most expensive chip in the whole lot. In fact, this chip's probably worth more than almost everything else in this package apart from the connector. So this chip was a very cheap way of being able to do stereo, but it halves your sample rate. 
So that's always worth keeping in mind. If you, even if you sent it a mono signal, find your left channel would be slightly different to your right channel. That's getting very nerdy, but just trust me when I say this is a very cheap way to do stereo, but it's ingenious, you know, I'll give them that. But of course, what we really want to be ingenious is the software. So let's have a bit of a look. And you can see our friends Ferry and Paul are back with another iteration of their software. And there's that logo again. Ah, oh, I love it. All right, we're in and you can see they've improved things. First of all, they've tidied up the interface. They've put a lot of the key features as buttons down the bottom. So let's crank that sample rate and hit record. And we get an error. So it's telling us it can't sample over 27.9 kilohertz, which is still pretty high. So let's go with that. And that is your sample time. But if you think about it, it's about right, because in stereo, you're using double the amount of memory. And this Amiga, even though it has an expansion of half a meg, only has a total of one meg of memory. There's no graphics card either, and when you consider that it's having to use the main memory of the system for graphics, as well as the operating system and the program data and the sequence data for the notes, plus when you put a sample into the sequencer, it actually copies it again in memory. So, yeah, that's not a lot of sample time, is it? So you can hear this as a series of drums, and I'm going to show you an alternate display mode, which is my favourite feature of this program. And check that out, it's like the old Fairlight, and you can see that it's showing you frequency versus time. And you can see each of those samples plotted out in front of you. Let's zoom into that very last sample. And if we listen to it slowly, you can see the donk at the start of it and then the way it just ferries out into a sort of a lower bandwidth sound as it trails into the distance. Oh, it's gorgeous. But as pretty as that looks, let's get technical with how things sound. I'm recording a frequency sweep from 20 hertz to 40 kilohertz. And let's have a listen on the Amiga. Whoa, what happened at the end there? Let's have a listen to that again. Something is definitely going crazy here. So you can see our logarithmic sweep going there, and just when you think it's over, all of these additional sounds start coming up. I mean, what are these sounds? Let's have a bit of a look at this. <laughs> and you can see there's some things here that you would expect. Mains hum, for instance. You know, that's uh, the plugs and things that are in my room causing a bit of hum. You'd expect that. And then there's the harmonic distortion. You expect that. We're going in and out of analog sockets. But this at the end is where the mystery starts to happen. Although if you look at it and you look at the frequencies which these dips are happening at, you'll notice that it's a multiple or a division of our sample rate. And our sample rate's 14 kilohertz, and there are those frequencies at 7, 14, and 28, and you can see that's where each of these dips out into a, a weird land of void. But of course, this is known as aliasing. And all aliasing means is if you don't have enough sample points to join the dots, and your dots start getting slower than your frequency, it's going to start generating new frequencies. And this is what you're hearing. Ultimately, what's happening is we're not averaging out our sound at the higher frequency domain. So what you do is put a pass filter on anything that you sample uh, before you sample it, but the sampler is cheap enough not to do that. And so you get this. But do you actually notice it? Not on everything, but let me give you three more examples. For a kid playing around with a sampler, you'd probably get away with it. 
But there's something a little bit more serious for me, and that is that the Stereo Master is filtering out audio in the low frequency domain, and it's doing it by a fair bit. That's a good nine decibels at the start there. So that means that our nice beefy bass is kind of being cut out. This did mean that when I was previously playing with the Stereo Master, I was consistently cranking up the bass and also sampling out of the headphone socket, and this was because of another issue. Due to the fact we didn't have the preamp of our more expensive samplers, you can see that the input on the Stereo Master is actually really low, especially compared to the master sound. And this is using a consumer lion level device, which, you know, tape decks and CD players were all set to consumer level. It was a standard and it should be giving a really chunky audio. And that's why in the previous video, I had all my audio sampling out of a headphone socket so I could really get a massive voltage into the Stereo Master. But it's way higher than any line level should be giving. So technically, the Stereo Master is way out of spec. But whatever, let's have a look at the sequencer. For starters, you can use the numeric keypad to enter notes directly without having to choose a pitch as well. And you've got an events list, finally, and a tempo control. Check this out. So what this means is if you insert a bunch of notes, and unfortunately there's no automatic way of doing this, you just have to hammer them in with the insert button. But eventually, you get enough notes in there that you can press play and get yourself something with locked timing that you can jam on top of. So let's add some drums to that. Now those drums were pretty tight. They weren't perfect, but they were very close. So let's replay that. And you can hear the timings changed. And this wouldn't matter if you could change the notes in the sequence, but you can't edit anything in the sequence. You have to play it live. And then on my third attempt, the software crashed. But when I rebooted, I decided I would make a drum beat by entering each note in manually. And it took a while, but this is what I ended up with. And it sounded terrible. That is painful. Oh dear, I was having a good old time there. <laughs> you can hear one of the problems I had was that I was down to two voices of audio. So I did drums and I did bass, and then that's it, because that's my stereo sound used up. And that was one of the issues with recording in stereo. Uh, you use two channels instead of one, because you use left and right, and normally you'd be using those as mono channels, and you'd end up with four channels instead of two channels. And there is a bit of an elephant in the room, and it is this. And testing. Okay, I've got this microphone running through the Stereo Master and you should be able to hear there's a little bit of fuzz as I stop with my words and give a bit more space. That fuzz in the background is the 8 bits bottoming out, so we're only getting a few values in that quiet range and this is particularly noticeable for voice. But it is the reason why a lot of people didn't take these 8-bit samplers so seriously. But, uh, I think as I sort of showed in the last video, if you have nice, loud, chunky samples and you make sure that your level controls are set right and you layer those samples together, you don't really notice as much that it's 8-bit audio because your output, once you're making music, is four 8-bit sounds together stacked on top of each other. And those together will make something that sounds generally a lot cleaner. While we've got this microphone plugged in, there is one final thing I can show you. <laughs> and this is, it's got a twist as well. What you're listening to now is my voice running through a real-time effects processor. I can choose effects like chorus, and I can even change the way that sounds. I can put crazy cool echoes on my voice. And I can make crazy robot voices. Can pitch my voice up. And pitch my voice down. 
But even though I've got all these cool effects, I can only preview them and I can't apply any of them to the waveform. They're just something I can listen to and that's it. So there's a reason you can't apply those real-time effects to the audio, and that is because MicroDeal wants you to go out and spend money on their professional product, which a lot of people said, no, we're not gonna go give money to MicroDeal. We're gonna go out and buy the DSS-8 instead. And we'll be looking at all of that in part number two when we check out mid-range samplers for the Commodore Amiga. Wow, we made it through part number one. Did we go through the rabbit hole too far? I don't know, but leave me some comments, give me some feedback, and I'm putting the Stereo Master back in its box for now. Phew, it really does make you appreciate modern sampling technology. I'll see you in the next episode. Bye.